Aloha. It's August the 26th. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. It's Trump week. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And today's show is titled RNC, Night of Lies, Fear for the Suburbs. Uh, if you've been watching the uh, RNC uh, for the last two nights, I think it's been an accumulation of three and a half years of bold-faced lies that this administration, and more importantly, the agencies that, that are part of this administration, and those that are in Congress that have been supporting Donald Trump's lies about just about everything. We have over 20,000 registered lies, certified lies that President Trump has told since inauguration. All I could say is that when you listen to what the uh, many of the speakers said last night and the night before, you're going, to what reality are we both on the same plane here? Uh, without further ado, I'm going to talk to our guests right now. Uh, welcome, everyone. We have Jay Fidel, Stephanie Dalton, and Winston Welch. Welcome, everybody. Hey, first Jim. topic. First topic of the day is the RNC. I, I, I think that um, if you've been watching any of the coverage and certain some of the commentary, the most stark, the thing that stands out the most is the fact that number one. We're seeing the White House used and abused uh, to promote Donald Trump's personal campaign. Uh, we see violations of the Hatch Act. We see the Rose Garden being misused. Um, they tore out half the trees just so they can get a better cam camera angle on the, uh, on the Rose Garden and the audience. We're seeing uh, Secretary Pompeo using his position as Secretary of State, uh, misusing his position uh, and, and basically putting out an endorsement for this administration and Donald Trump although he doesn't mention Donald Trump by name, but he is in Israel, and most likely that was funded by the taxpayers' dollars for him to go there and do so. Uh, Jay, I'm gonna go to you first. Uh, what are your first impressions about the, the RNC and what strikes, what stands out as uh, the most glaring of lies that have been reported in the last two nights? That's a hard question. You know, there's, so many I, of, there's so many of them. Yeah. Yeah, I, my, uh, it's a problem for me. What stands out about the RNC is that I can't watch it. Uh, it's just lie after lie after lie. And you know, it's, it's predictable they would lie. It's predictable that he and his whole family would, would send us lies, incredible lies, just distortions of truth everywhere. What, but that's not what bothers me. What bothers me is that there are 30, 40 million people out there who buy them, who buy them wholesale. And most of the Senate buys them wholesale. And, and that's why I, I, I lose my lunch whenever I watch that. So if you're asking me about the worst lies, you're asking the wrong person. I can't watch it, Tim. Well, let me I, throw this out as an idea. Is, are we just numb after three and a half, four years, numb to all the 20,000 lies? And it's not that we don't speak out. It's just that we're, we're just burned out. Rather, that we're burned out to speak out. Do you think that's more of the syndrome that we're dealing with? Not for me. Not for anybody on, on this panel. Not for anybody who, you know, I know who is in the, you know, the, the thinking, the thinking category, but there are a lot of people out there that defend the lies um, and have an answer for every single one of them to support him. Um, and that's, you know, that's the part that gets me. And I suppose in a sense that that means they're burned out. In other words, 20,000 lies and, and the one right after 20,000, um, they know at some level of their consciousness, that's a lie but they're burned out about arguing with it. They're, they're tired of trying to evaluate the truth of it. Uh, so that's a kind of burnout there. And as a result, every Trumper accepts every lie. And they're living in an alternate universe. It's very hard to talk to them because you, you can't convince them. You can't, you can't make them understand that lies are no good for our democracy. Well, I'm gonna go into a few uh, details because you know cl the claim is Donald Trump has been lying and he's lying right now for the RNC and all the speakers that are speaking on his behalf are, are filled with lies too. But that's a claim. So every claim should be supported by evidence. So let's look at some of the speakers. Uh, let's look at Kimberly Gil Guilfoyle. Um, I call her the screaming banshee. Uh, there's no other words I can describe her because her address was something to behold. But the bottom line is she was basically saying that the suburbs were gonna be overrun by, by the Democrats, the socialists, um, that there's going to be crime in the streets and, and rioting and, and looting. Um, by the way, all this that's taking place is taking place not under Joe Biden's administration, but Donald Trump's administration. 
Yeah, but let me add something about that. You know, um, of course, it's it's not really true, and the um, the demonstrators are out there. They're demonstrating quietly First Amendment demonstrations, but it falls it falls somehow to help Trump when these uh, violent people, the skinheads in Kenosha, Wisconsin, come out and shoot people in the street. It's not it's not the liberals who are shooting anybody. It's the skinheads who are shooting them. And, uh, you know, my advice to the liberals is go home. We, we don't need this because, it, you know, because Trump is, you know, I don't know if you heard, but Trump is sending his brown shirts into Kenosha now. Um, it falls, it, it, it works for him. He can use this now. He, it can validate the lie that he gave the other day. Probably the worst lying is going on about Biden. Um, you know, making Biden look like he's a communist, filthy um, you know, pinko socialist person, uh, and he's going to wreck the country. Uh, what, what's re remarkable about that is the one wrecking the country, and they're all talking like that. All of the Trump speakers are talking like this: that Biden is going to wreck the country, that Biden is going to be, uh, you know, uh, created a huge deficit and all this. It, it's turning the the tail, isn't it? Turning the tables on Trump. Trump does this stuff, and then he blames Biden. That is out of 1984. It's, it's criticizing the other guy for what you're doing. It's well, right out of Hitler's playbook. Yeah, well, I, what I think the Democratic Convention tried to do is portray where they're moving in the future. There's actually a platform with the Democrat uh, National Com uh, Convention. What we know here is that uh, the RNC has no platform and they announced in writing that they weren't going to have a platform for the 2020 election. They're going to use the 2016 platform and the key point of their, their platform for this, this, this election year is quote unquote, undying support for Donald Trump. I mean, where's the vision of the RNC? Where's the, the vision of the GOP about where we're moving in uh, these times of turmoil and a, a wrecked economy. And we see no vision, no vision of, of prosperity in 2021. I find that really um, glaring as the difference between the RNC and the DNC. Your thoughts? It's cult following. That's what they're trying to achieve. And when you, when you do that, you criticize anyone who is on the other side. That's what he did in 2016, lock her up, lock her up. Um, and, you know, and now it's uh, Sleepy Joe uh, trying to uh, hang labels on, the, on the, uh, the opponent in such a way to, you know, to, to diminish his credibility and, and Trump to say, um, you, you, you have to rely on me. I'm the one who can take you to the promised land. And the great big, huge Hitlerian line lie there is that he's had four years to take us to the promised land and he's taken us to the seventh circle instead. Um, so, I mean, really it's like everything out of his mouth is a lie. I have such trouble watching that. But I, as I said, I have more trouble believing that there are some people, millions, tens of millions of people in this country that buy all of it. Well, if you remember, if you remember the statement, what projection is, is to take your your ills and your, you know, the things that you have deficit and project them on everybody else. And that's certainly what I see in the RNC uh, completely in the last few nights is taking everything they're guilty of and trying to basically blame it on the, the the future Biden well, administration. So let Stephanie, me, let me go, go ahead. ahead to that, that you know, back, okay, in, back in 2016, okay, uh, he, he he made himself a cult. Um, he lied about the other side, and it worked. It worked for a lot of people. And the big question, I'd be very interested in everybody thought about this, is that working? Because if it's working, we're in deep kimchi. Well, yeah. not only is that working, it's and not only are the lies going by like uh, fruit flies on a run, the uh, innuendo is unbelievable. I think one of my biggest difficulties in watching any of it, and people talk about it, is what is listed as one of the reasons we don't want Biden because he's so social, going to be socialism. It's also because um, he's going to unfund the police. And that was something that I heard talked about this morning in Florida and in Texas. They're very concerned. Well, Stephanie, let me ask you this. I mean, Joe Biden now has, he has a microphone. Why isn't Joe Biden coming out and addressing these damaging points, I think, that are being made at the RNC? I think they're, they're hitting their mark in some, some circles. And why isn't Joe Biden coming out and saying, 
I'm going to set the record straight right here, right now. Why isn't that happening? Why aren't the Democrats? They should have put the kibosh on this in the beginning because some group in Seattle or wherever said defund the police. That's not what they meant was to actually take the money away from the police, as you all know. Okay, it well, was a restructuring and a redeployment of the money to assist the police to do the best job, have more choices than run after them, grab them, and shoot them. I, I get yeah. that, but yeah. Joe Biden is the figurehead of the Democratic Party right now. But Why isn't he taking to the podium I, and, and, and addressing these specific criticisms properly? Because they're not, because we've got this other problem, which is huge, and it's the level of this activity. The level is not what we want. This role, the president, these challenges, our status, our issues, these are not at the tic tac playground fifth grade level. Oh, no, you didn't say that. No, I wish you did. Look, no, I, I, I learned something yeah. a long time ago. You never leave a room when someone has laid a lie against you and, and hope that people didn't take it seriously or will forget about it. No, you never kidding. leave a room. Now, that, that's contrary to maybe previous generations on how you handle criticism and, and how you, do, you don't lower yourself to that level. Um, we're in a street okay. fight right now, and well, Joe well, Biden yeah. needs to take every, everything that's laid against him and take it seriously and address it on the spot. And uh, I think that's going to be a big mistake for the Democratic Party if they don't start doing it. Well, are there advisors that would would give the who's advising him? What about a little analysis here? What about Joe Biden doesn't need an advisor. He should be smart enough to know this and he should take it upon himself to get to that podium and do what he needs to do. Well, I, it, it could be true. But on the other hand, this is a big deal what he's it is doing. a big deal I... <laughs> and uh and um he and it's a lot to be thinking about so if he needs a tweak he needs a tweak but um they should have done it my my blame is on the the democrats okay. when that first uh, happened that should have been clarified and i think it, we it, agree on that let me just point out something that there is actually some statements of truth that have been um that have been uh, thrown out here at the rnc and i would like to talk about one of them because it's a big one i don't know if anyone listened to uh Lawrence Kudlow, when he had the podium, but when he uh, said that the administration plans to cut Social Security payroll tax, that caught my attention. And if you're a recipient of uh, Social Security or Social Security uh, disability, um, that might catch your attention as well. Did you um, happen to catch that, Stephanie? Um, I did. Um, I just, uh, I, it's another part of this whole lie thing. It doesn't matter what they're saying. They can say anything they want that that will they think at the moment will make uh, a dent for them or get them another point. So I can't. Uh, but and and then it doesn't stick. Why wait, 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 wait. Like when Trump did his proclamation two weeks ago, the one that seemed to drift away into nothing. One of the elements of the proclamation is that he was going to defer payroll tax. That's correct. And, uh, in, in fact, we're having a show about that later today. If you defer payroll tax, that means you're not making contributions to Social, social Security and, and Medicare. Mm -hmm. And that, that will cripple Social Security and Medicare. Well, one of the he things he already, said, Jay, was that- He's already done it. Well, one yeah, of the things that he said he was going to have it funded out of the general, the general fund. Now, we know how oh. the general fund gets sliced and diced. Uh, a thousand different ways by everyone in the Senate and the House. Um, it's basically saying Social Security as we know it will not exist. Because I mean, that's just the bottom line. Depended on to follow up anything that's left. That's why we have the Congress. That's why we have the two houses. That's why we write all these 10,000 pages because you have to have the follow up. Yes, okay, we'll pay it from the general fund. Well, even if that actually would be accepted, then the whole thing has to be how, when, and what's that going to hit up? Because we're talking six, seven percent from each of us worker bees for that FICA. That, I mean, you may not notice it's, in fact, it's not that big a deal. I mean, everybody likes a break from it when it comes, but it's not that big a deal. They may not notice it. Well, without it, Social it's... Security disability goes away in six months. So it is a big deal. It's well, just, no, if um... it went away, but I'm talking coming out of the payroll, coming out of yeah. your check. Oh, yeah. So, I yeah, mean, yeah, exactly. it's a nice relief, but it's six, seven percent. And, uh, but, and, and so at times 300 million. Yeah. So anyway, that All is, right. is a big deal. But sometimes, thank you, Stephanie. Thank, thank you. you so much. Um, Winston, let me come to you. And 
what struck out in your mind and for over the last few nights uh, about the RNC and if any particular speaker came to your mind or just the, the setting itself or, or what, what pivotal moment has uh, struck a chord within you? I mean, well, the whole thing is a little bit more than a little bit off. I, I think Kimberly, Kimberly's uh, uh, Bill Hoyle's speech was uh, certainly, you know, a Kool-Aid moment uh, where she was uh, screaming to people. I don't think she understands, though, that that Donald Trump proposed selling Puerto Rico, which is where her father is from. Would he retain his citizenship if Puerto Rico got sold? I'm not sure she figured that one out yet. But she is the uh, the boyfriend, uh, the girlfriend of uh, Donald Trump Jr. and the ex girlfriend of the governor of California. So that's an interesting mix right there. Um, oh, it is interesting. Yeah, her, her yeah, so her- Captain Newsom her, would date her too, a little. Yeah, yeah, so th you know, that one was an interesting moment. Uh, a, a, another uh, uh, moment where they said, nobody cares about the Hatch Act outside of the Beltway. Uh, yeah, actually there's laws that exist for the whole nation that we have that exist outside the Beltway um, that we don't have. Uh, our civil servants working on political campaigns. Um, what Melania said was a total honesty is what we citizens deserve from our president. Okay, uh, that's great. I, and she says, but she didn't say that he gives us honesty. She says, whether you like it or not, you always know what he's thinking. Uh, that may be, um, I, I mean, she's, she actually had probably the most human speech of, of, of many, uh, but I, I mean, it's all meaningless. It's like Jay said, th this is preaching to the choir. Who's tuning into this? Can you watch it with a straight face, even for for um, for humor? I mean, when you look at it, you're thinking, wow. But, well, well, Winston, you know, let me, Jay, let me, let me address that. What, what's, that the, what's happening to that 12% between 40% and 51% that have not made up their minds or they just don't know what's what to think about Biden or Trump? What about those people? What are they thinking as they watch this? You know, that's the million dollar question. And Stephanie's right. Like, what are the Democrats doing? If Joe Biden doesn't want to do it, he needs to send out his attack dogs. He's got uh, Kamala Harris. And he's got a whole bunch of really good, smart people that can act in proxy for him if he doesn't want to do it. That's fine. We are playing for the soul of the nation. But I think, Jay, you know, when you say that they don't listen to anything, um, that you, there's no argument to get there. They say the same thing about the other side. They think that we are delusional. And so how do you bridge this? I, I don't have any good answer for that. But I mean, when you listen to Donald Trump speak, he says, you know, he's saying that God is talking to him, you know, the, about the uh, uh, God is testing him um, for uh, the coronavirus after he, you know, has blamed a lot of different uh, agencies. I would go with what his, um, uh, you know, he declared himself the only barrier between uh, uh, total anarchy, madness, and chaos. Well, coming from a king of that, I that he's the barrier to it. I think he's a gateway to it. But I would go with what the president's sister had to say. Now, I notice she's probably not going to be on the D, uh, the RNC's lineup. Uh, she said um, all he wants to do is appeal to his base in a conversation secretly recorded by her niece, Mary Trump. He has no principles, none none and his base i mean my god if you were a religious person you want to help people not do this barry 83 was aghast at how her 74 year old brother operated as president his goddamn excuse my french tweet and lying oh my god she said i'm talking too freely but you know the change of stories the lack of preparation the lying holy be that's what the president's sister has and she's known him all of his life and, and rather intimately. And if you don't believe her as a sister or a disgruntled person, she's also a federal judge or was a federal judge. And so, you know, you can go with uh, his family's own um, quotes on this. I think the brother had some unchoice things to say about him too, you know, not that, he, that he's passed away, but well, I, I, before they were- I think these are good points straight. you're making, Winston, is that the fact that, you know, again, the title of the show is The, the Night of Lies. And um, everything, everything serves his purpose and through everything goes through the filter of being reelected as president of the United States. Um, I guess- If you have someone like the sister though, that's meaningful for people. If, if one of our siblings came on and said this about us, we would uh, hopefully uh, recoil and, and, and rightly so, if that's how our character would be described. So that may be the way to reach the 12%.
it may bleed through in whatever the 12% reads, whether it's People Magazine or I don't know what they read because people are so into their camps already. Um, I don't know. Let me ask, let me change the subject and ask you this. Um, did you have any response or reaction to the, uh, the citizenship, uh, the naturalization ceremony that took place uh, in the White House? And um, I did. I, I thought those poor souls were being used as, as props. Um, I also didn't like the fact that there were two Marines being part of that ceremony. And that's definitely not allowed in the military. <clears throat> so um, what was your reaction to that? And also, did you have any reaction to the power of pardon as if uh, Donald Trump was the great Nero uh, deciding the fate of um, uh, an ex-convict and granting him pardon? Uh, I thought that was a little bit of the Roman Coliseum well, days. Yeah, it, it's just it's just theatrics. Uh, you know, I, th I think we we need to not pay any attention to that and, and not get distracted by where it's happening or someone shouting too loud or giving someone a partner. It, it, that's it's all, you know, look who's coming there. The, the, the gun toting couple from St. Louis, you know, they're they're speakers of the convention. What are they what are they going to be talking about? You know how to I, I mean, it's 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 interesting. It's interesting to watch other people like Nikki Haley. Uh, there's an interesting article in, in uh, Politico, I think it was, uh, about the future for the GOP. Is it going to be John Trump Jr., whose eyes were so glazed over? I don't know what was going on there, but um, uh, or Nikki Haley, who really had uncharitable things to say about Donald Trump four years ago, and now she's in line, just like uh, uh, Lindsey Graham and so many other people, where they were saying this man is the wrong choice for America and the wrong choice for our party. Period. And now they're towing a different line. So we'll see what happens out of this. But we have to look ahead. We'll, we'll and see. see. How we'll do we see. bring our nation? Uh, candid to disclosure here. Candid disclosure to everyone here. I had to watch the first night and the second night to prepare for this show. I don't have to watch Thursday night or Friday night as much <laughs> or nearly as much. So um, read, the uh, read the summary online. You know, watching it can, you, you know, the, it's important to stay informed, but too much is going to be toxic. And, uh, you know, the, the thing is, Tim, as, as we look at, this and we say getting news from such different sources how are we going to come together post election and and, and get a any sort of um, healing or uh, you know sense of, of shared values again and that's going to be the trick for joe biden we have a lot of challenges to this election but i hope that this and other things coming out in the next 70 days will expose um, a lot of the unsavoriness of this administration and good the point, last Winston. four years, Thank and you. all the ugliness that it represents. Yeah, good point, Winston. Thank you for your thoughts. Hey, Jay, this week um, we had two things on the coronavirus front. Number one is the FDA, uh, basically in lockstep with Donald Trump, announced the, the great miracle of the convalescence plasma therapy, um, number one. And number two is, as of this morning, the CDC now is saying, and I think under pressure of the administration, that if you've been exposed to the coronavirus, you don't necessarily need to take a test because uh, if you're asymptomatic, it's, I don't know, it's not important, but if you're showing symptoms, maybe you do get a test. Your thoughts on that? Uh, these two, um, what I think is administration influenced um, on a independent uh, health organization. Well, it's been weaponized. It's been politicized completely. If you thought the CDC was above the, of the fray, it's not. And that guy who uh, was now running it, he's been compromised. Um, he can't say no to Donald Trump. And both of the issues you mentioned um, are, you know, from Donald Trump and the White House. And with due regard for the fact that there's a, a Republican convention going on and there's, and there's an election in a couple of months, um, both of them are crazy. Um, that, that particular um, <clears throat> plasma therapy has, has been in use for a while. It's not brand new. Uh, last Sunday night was supposed to be a big revelation, but in fact, it's been used without great success. That's one thing. That's correct. Um, does, the, uh, does that 12% buy into the fact that this is not the miracle cure that Donald Trump's saying is a miracle cure? O almost like it's hydroxychloroquine? Well, let's assume the 12% uh, read the newspaper. They probably picked it up because it was all over the newspaper. But if they didn't read the newspaper uh, or if they focused on Fox News, um, they won't know. And I think one of the big problems in this country is not only education, but uh, self, 
determined ignorance, ignorance uh, as, as, a, as a benefit, as a, as a positive attribute. I'm ignorant and I'm, ha I'm proud of being ignorant. Um, so I think a lot of people don't, don't know this and they buy what he has to say because that's all they hear. The other issue that you raised uh, was the issue about testing. You know, back in Tulsa, uh, Trump said, I'm gonna cut back on testing. And I thought he was kidding. I thought that was a, just an outrageous, stupid remark, but no, he really meant it. And he's taken a lot of steps to do that. And now, and now to have the CDC say, say on his behalf that uh, you don't have to test, test is not as, not as important anymore. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, cutting back on the number of tests, <clears throat> that's incredible. And the, the, the um, medical community is, is fighting that tooth and nail. And yet, though, he's the leader. He's making these statements and people are buying into these statements. And the net effect will be, you know, there'll be less testing. And, and we won't know what's going on. Um, you know, so you have all these things. It's sort of like the election gambit. You have all these things layered, which, which are dedicated to try to make it sound like the coronavirus is not as serious as it really is. You have less testing, you have less cases. Um, you screw up the medicine and confuse everybody about the medicine. Um, nobody knows which, when, which way is up. And if, if you're part of that 12%, you're confused. Yeah, and this I, is this is really dangerous for a country which is number one in in coronavirus cases. I, I agree, and that, I think if there was the big lie, if there was a number one lie of the RNC, it was the great job Donald Trump and the administration has done with coronavirus pandemic here in this country. Um, that's the big lie, I guess. Oh, we just got a question come in, and the question is, Jay, I'll take this to you: How do we stay informed but remain sane at the same time? <laughs> Well, uh, that's that's a really difficult question. For myself, you know, I watch MSNBC and uh, CNN proudly. I read the Times, the Post, the Guardian, um, and I and I, I learn. I think which way is up from them. I, I go on Fox News to see how long I can stay there before the first lie happens, and usually uh, it's less than fifteen seconds. I turn off Fox News as soon as I spot the first lie. Um, so, you know, and, and you know what? I talk to people. I want to get pushback. I want to get feedback. Uh, I want to hear what other people, sometimes I just call people up, as, as you guys know, on the phone, tell me, validate me. Am I crazy <laughs> or what? And I think, you know, in the time of COVID, we don't do enough of that. Uh, we should be testing our thoughts out on our friends and, um, and on Trumpers too, see what they have to say, although All you're right. not going to change their minds. Thank you, Jay. Um, Stephanie, hey, we're, all, we're out of time. You get the last comment. Um, your impression about this CDC uh, influence and in the FDA. Uh, last comment, please. Keep it short. Yeah, very sad because uh, the, cri the criteria and their status has been eroded and they're going to have to work it back. Also, thinking forward, got to get along with all these people. And that's what I'm trying to do in answer to the question. And it hurts to have to do it. But, and I don't know if I want to be American anymore, but these are my citizen uh, colleagues and we're going to have to get it on together one way or the other, you know, what, right. one, one, some way, yeah. All right, we're out of time. Um, everyone, we have less than 70 days left to the election. I ask you to um, grab on and hold on to your fortitude <laughs> and your patience. Uh, we have two more nights of the uh, RNC. Uh, best wishes to all of us that can uh, watch it. And um, that's all for this week. I'm Tim Apicella. Come watch us next week, Wednesday, 11 o'clock for Trump Week. Aloha, everyone. <laughs>